All right. Well, Mark, thanks so much for joining us on the Build Podcast. It's great to have you on the show. Yeah, good to talk to you again, Blake. So one of the questions that I get most often about PLG is how to transform an existing company from a sales-led motion to a product-led motion, uh, especially if it's an established, somewhat mature company. The question is, is that even possible? How do you do it? Uh, And if it is possible, who's an example of somebody that has done it successfully? And whenever I get that question, I always say, yes, it is possible, but it isn't easy. It's a long process. And the best example I can point to is HubSpot. So for this conversation today, if I felt like it was the perfect opportunity to hear the story directly from you because you were there helping getting the ball rolling and a part of the team that established PLG at HubSpot in the first place. So would love to hear the story. You know, when was this at HubSpot? What was going on at the company? Why was this an idea? And then how did it start to, to unfold? So I know there's a lot there, but would love to, to oh, yeah, let's, the, uh, let's do, I mean, it's such history a, lesson. So passionate about it. I think it's so important for the ecosystem these days with PLG. I think it's a really important question, and I don't envy the person that needs to do it. Um, and yet you kind of need to do it. I, I think... Um, I think PLG is like SaaS in terms of the disruptive potential. I don't. I don't think it's as applicable as SaaS was to the breadth of categories in software, but I think it's applicable to more categories than people think. I think if it is applicable to your category, it's going to be hard to fend off the PLG attacker, just like it was hard for the on-premise ex- incumbents to fend off the SaaS attackers, and the transition is gonna to be tough too. Just like it was tough for the the on-premise incumbents to transition to SaaS. You know, it went, it went, they went kind of went through a phase of like, oh, SaaS isn't gonna work, like no CIO is gonna put their stuff in the cloud, to oh gosh, this thing's kind of working, to oh my gosh, we're losing market share really fast. Let's hire McKinsey or BCG and try to figure this thing out. And you know, some did okay and a lot didn't. And I think that's what we're up against here. Um, so, yes, HubSpot did do it. Um, and I have thought a lot about and helped some organizations transition as well. Um, and so the way we did it, I can certainly present in an abstract way so that folks who are thinking about it can, can do their best to apply it to their business. Um, we didn't do it because of loss of market share. Um, we did it because um, like the, the kind of personal story, the, the, the deep story of within HubSpot was, it was probably about a year into the business. We're probably about 2007, 2008. Uh, there was probably like 12 of us. And um, uh, one, one of the people we went to MIT, you know, a lot of us at the founding team were part out of MIT and one person a lot of us were tight with was Drew Houston, who went off and started Dropbox um, after MIT. And obviously they were one of the few companies that did this motion. We didn't call it PLG then, we talked it, we called it Freemium. And Darmesh would kind of watch it, talk to Drew, and like was pretty envious, honestly, <laughs> of it. He's like, we have to do this. We have to do this, because this is such a a less friction way to distribute the software, especially in the SMB ecosystem that we're in. And, and we're like, okay, let's do it. And, you know, we had, we probably had about two or 3 million in revenue at the time. Um, we probably had, I don't know, I don't, I forget how many customers that equate, thousands of customers. And at the time we were probably selling the thing for like two, 300 bucks a month. And we're like, okay, let's roll it out. Free product and $20 a month upgrade failed miserably, failed miserably. And pretty obvious in hindsight why that was the case. And I think it sheds important abstract lessons on where um, PLG is applicable and and where it's not. And um, the first part, the the main uh, result there was we didn't have a low time and effort to value use case you need to have a low time and effort to value and ideally retainable value to be able to pull that off. And for the HubSpot marketing software, um, 
you know, the, the whole premise was like, if you blog for four months, your, your leads will go up four times. Well, blogging for four months is not like a low time. It takes a while to get to that aha moment if it takes exactly. four months. <laughs> you know, Dropbox is like, yeah, click here and you'll back up your device in 30 seconds. Great. It's beautiful. Yeah. Right. Um, so we didn't have it. The, um, the other thing that was against us, which is very relevant to your, your question, Blake, is we were trying to do it in the construct of having an existing install base albeit only being a couple million bucks in revenue. But when you have, it's, it's hard enough to like, you and I start a company, Blake, and we're like, let's do PLG. Let's attack the marketing and software arena. Cool, we have a complete white space. And we can architect like, what's the right use case that should be free and how do things get moved up to the print? That's, that's fine, that's white space. It's still hard, really hard. But when you add to that, the complexity of putting enough in that free product where it works, but doesn't cannibalize the $3 million that you have in revenue, which is gonna, you know, so that everyone doesn't, doesn't downgrade from 300 bucks a month to like 20 bucks a month. And you have to explain it to your next investors why your revenue went down by 50%. That's next to impossible. Yeah, and that's so like, that, that's what we're talking about here. Plus there's the fact that this customer journey, you know, takes a while to have the payoff. And so the mix just wasn't right at the first attempt for, for PLG. Yeah, wasn't the right use case and very hard. We didn't approach it in the right way, um, if, even if it was the case. Okay, so then forward fast the clock to roughly 2012, 2013, okay? Now we have 80 million in revenue, I don't know, 10,000 customers, uh, I don't know, 1,000 employees, I'm not sure. And we decide to go into the CRM space, into the sales software space. We're exclusively a marketing software company. And we decide to stay in SMB, go into the CRM space, feel like there's a lot of white space there. Now we can do it. Now we can do it. And, and that's sort of like the first abstract like lesson for people who are, are concerned that they're, they're in a category that is PLG-able and they're gonna be attacked. And that is you have to create a safe sandbox for a small team to go and figure out PLG. And it's gonna take like at least six months, probably more like 12. And that team, I, I don't know, at least five or six people. So, so for now that could be a new market. It could be like an international market or you could carve out like a territory in the US. It could be a new product like what was the case in our sector, right? Um, so yeah, that's what we did. And, um, and we actually followed um, Clay Christensen's Innovator's Dilemma and Michael Tushman's Ambidextrous Organization. If you wanna read those frameworks, I find them to be great guides on how to do this. And the whole, one of the cliff note versions of it is you can't, you have to set it up so that the big company doesn't slow down the, the project. And so what Brian and Darmesh said is like, okay, Mark, we're going to team you up with Christopher O'Donnell. Um, Christopher was like, uh, you know, a, a, a very successful product leader in our organization, went off to be chief product officer of the organization. Um, he's like the two of you. Our, this is critical project. Like we, we honestly feel like we might lose to Salesforce because they just bought like exact target. So they're clearly coming into our sector. We have to do this. So we're going to put the two of you in charge of it and you're going to like start your own company. Like we don't want to see you. <laughs> like we'll give you the, the bottom floor of the office. Um, do not build this on our tech stack. Like we run the entire uh, platform of, of HubSpot marketing software on NetSuite, build it on Stripe. Like don't let anything slow it down. We don't, don't have any overlap. Um, so truly kind start... of no, no, no rules, no holds barred. Like you get, yeah. you know, carte blanche, you know, startup yes. within a startup, like go figure out what the right answer is for this problem for this market. Yes. And sort of You have to like... do it that way. Yeah. Yeah, because Blake, we couldn't, we couldn't say, oh, I think this is the right answer. And then does that benefit HubSpot? Because the minute you say that, 
you're you're constricting your opportunity to perhaps be a little more guided by HubSpot's contacts as opposed to the true market opportunity, right? And so we had to be like like sincere, genuine, and true to the opportunity without being distracted and also anything to be slowed down. We couldn't get, we didn't want to have to get approval from the CFO to do something or from the, the, the CPO on that side to do something, right? And so totally different tech stack. They were like, here's budget for like 20 people. You can poach 10 from the current team and you have to hire 10 from the outside. Okay. So that was like the compromise of like using resources. And so that, that was it. And, um, and you know, that doesn't come without, um, comp like negativity as we started to scale, like people would be a customer of the marketing product and be using a CRM and they call up our support team with a question on the CRM and they'd be like, I don't know. I'm on the support. I've never, I've never been trained on the CRM. Like it, it doesn't come without cost, but those are necessary costs to figuring this out. Okay. So I, I can tell you more about like where we got from there, but I don't know, Blake, if you have like in the patterns you've seen or questions on that, you know? Yeah. Well, we'll maybe go in a, a little bit deeper into the specifics. Um, so, y- you know, you want to go after sales um, and, and build something that eventually will become the sales hub uh, within HubSpot. Um, but you didn't necessarily, at least from my understanding, kind of build a better sales force, you know, on day one. Um, so what, what did you end up building and what was that kind of progression to ultimately get to, you know, full CRM platform and, and I guess with this PLG lens, like what was the starting point and, and how did you make self-service work, um, you know, within the CRM space? Okay. So first off, it was like, um, getting the right team, um, which a lot of people don't do well. Um, a lot of people in, in, whether you're starting from PLG from scratch or you're starting uh, as, a, as a project like this, a lot of PLG or gr- the growth team in charge of PLG in B2B reports to uh, the marketing team. And that's the first mistake um, because to PLG and growth is all about rapid experimentation on the entire growth funnel. That's what the growth team owns is they own driving users into the funnel, getting them to activate, getting them to become DAO wows and mouse, getting them to trip the monetization wire and getting them to retain and maybe drive virality if you're doing virality. That's what they own. And the best growth teams just run rapid experiments in a data-driven environment to drive the conversion rate day after day after day. We're talking about like multiple experiments a week, not like three a month. We're talking about rapid experimentation. And if you just put that team in like marketing, you only have marketers. You don't have any engineers. Engineers don't want to work in marketing. And so when you put that team in marketing and only have marketers, you, you dramatically restrict the footprint of experiments you can do. And so that's the first thing is we have to make this like a product driven team. It's a lot of engineers, a lot of designers, like it's engineers, designers, data scientists, um, that's the driver here. Okay. And we went out and, um, uh, Christopher Rodano, we call him C Todd. I think you call him C Todd Blake. Um, uh, he, he was like the best growth leader I know is Brian Belfort. And I'm like, all right, I remember Belfort. I remember that meeting Belfort in like 2006 when I was a student at MIT. He was working on like bound, bound list or something. He was working on a startup in Cambridge. And he was an impressive guy. And I hadn't talked to him in a while. So I looked him up. He was out in San Francisco. So I flew out there and we grabbed a drink at like the St. Regis or something. And he's like, hey, what's up? And I was like, hey, we're, we're going to do a PLG product uh, for the sales product at HubSpot. And I want, can you come help us? Like team up with me and C. Todd and like be our growth leader and teach the whole company how to do growth well. And he laughed, like, I was like, Whoa, what's so funny? And he's a founder type. He's like, yeah, you know, like anytime like these larger companies come, like they just don't, they don't like make it interesting enough to compare to me going off and doing my own thing. 
And I'm like, well, you know, you have a lot of fans at the company. Darmesh, me, C. Todd, uh, David Cancel, who was our head of product at the time, and try me. And so we got it done. He moved his wife over to Boston, and we we spent three years doing it. And so that was that was a big thing. The right team, the right mindset around the stuff. And he taught us a ton of stuff about. He taught us a lot of the stuff. And then of course it was like getting back to our point here in your question, Blake. Is like, well, what is the product? Because you can't start off with like a CRM. That's not low time and effort to value. Adopting a CRM is like putting a bunch of stuff in there, setting up your stages. Like we need something like ideally more like Dropbox, right? And so I think it was C. Todd and his team uh, created like the Sidekick app, which was more about just like initially just like understanding when and who is opening up your e your sales emails. And they brought everything through a Chrome extension into your email. So it's like the, the and, and so that was a starting point. I was like, yeah, just download this thing and you'll know when people are opening their emails. And then, there was competitive apps out there then. Um, but because we did this in um, a very growth oriented, rapid experimentation way, and because we had like, you know, the advantages of the HubSpot brand still, um, we were able to accumulate, you know, lots of users very quickly. And that allowed us to leverage that opening use case to expand the footprint of the use cases into the, what we all know as a broader CRM. It kind of, it kind of was like, you'd be surprised that if you like, if you get someone to, in this particular case, you get someone to like install a Chrome extension into their email and start tracking all their emails, like, guess what? The CRM is just populating behind the scenes. <laughs> it's zero work. Yeah. It's like, Hey, by the way, uh, you know, you've been using a psychic game for a month. Um, we have a database, which is basically a CRM of everybody you emailed when they emailed you back, how often they opened up your stuff. You know, it was like, it was kind of like this self-built CRM. So there was all of this value to the person who was using it, uh, which was seeing when somebody opens your email and being able to call them right at that moment and stuff that sales reps care about and SDRs care about. Um, but then on the back end, it's creating exhaust and you're capturing that exhaust and that's starting to build the foundations of what in the future can become the CRM. Exactly. And that's just like, that's a very specific case of an abstract point here, which is like some well thought out packaging design about like what is that opening use case that's low time and effort to value okay single player mode is a big advantage right like if you you know good job by slack and zoom who are not single player mode but like if it's if it is single player mode meaning you can get value by yourself like that's much easier um and lots of value for the end user as opposed to the executive buyer. You know, I've looked at other folks who are like, hey, I've got this like forecasting tool and I want to do PLG. And they, like the forecasting tool is valuable for the executive, but the person that like actually has to like do it is the salesperson. And they don't care that much about the forecast. Yeah, it's not right? solving so it's like their it, problem. It's solving right. the boss's problem. So it's exactly. like- you built the wrong product for the wrong persona. There's a mismatch there. Right, exactly. So those, those are some of the abstract lessons we can pull away from the selection of that free use case. And then there's a whole another set of like decisions around, well, what, what should the pricing tier be based on? And you know, that, that's tricky because like, I'm still kind of working on, maybe you have guidance, Blake, cause you've been thinking about this space a lot, but I, I know like if you can choose something that doesn't restrict more usage by the end user, it's kind of good because it just gets more entrenched. If it doesn't restrict like the network effect of this thing to spread across the organization and maybe even other organizations, that's really good. Um, so I like to kind of try to charge for things that like the executives really value, but doesn't restrict like things like um, security or user roles or integration with the bigger tech stack. You know what I mean? These are, these are things that are like, like the end user doesn't care about as much, but like when I find out as a CIO or something that like, 
I can't do this stuff. And I, I'm, I'm torn between turning off this app that like all my people love or just like paying up and locking it down, you know, like making it secure. Like that, I, most CIOs want to do that today. You know, so I, I don't know if you've been thinking much about the abstract guidance on the pricing tiers, you know? Yeah, I, I think uh, two examples I really like there um, because it was so, in retrospect, just so clever and it worked so well uh, would be Zoom and Slack. So they both limited the usage to a degree, but not so much that, you know, you get locked out of the account and you stop using the app. You know, so for Zoom, they didn't say you can only do so many meetings. You know, you can only do five per month or once you've done 10 meetings, then like, you know, you're locked out. They set the limit at the time of the meeting. Now, if they had set the limit too short, you know, 25 minutes, that would have been too, like you actually want there to be a little bit of annoyance, but not too much annoyance. Like nobody has a 25 minute meeting. Everybody has a minimum of 30 minute meeting. And so they set the limit at 40 minutes. And so you can get your 30 minute meeting done um, you can get really darn close to 45 minutes, which some people do, but you can't get to an hour. But you can get still the full value out of that 30 minutes or up to that 40 minute limit. Uh, and then you can do as many of those meetings as you want. But then at some point, you know, you're going to need sort of that hour long meeting. You're going to need that three hour long board meeting or whatever it is. And then you're, you're happy to pay because you've been using it for 30 minute meetings, you know, for, for months or whatever it is. Right. And so like Zoom did it really well. Slack, similarly, um, they didn't limit the number of messages you can send. There's no point, you, they didn't limit the number of users that can be on you know, a free version of Slack. Um, but when you hit that 10,000 message limit, it doesn't, it's not like you get locked out and you can no longer communicate with your colleagues. You just can't keep looking back. And so at some point, you know, the value of Slack is both the communication that you get sort of in the moment, but then it's also, you know, all right, let me jump into a conversation and see the whole conversation history uh, and get up to speed. And so now I can contribute. Uh, and so there's more of that advanced usage uh, benefit of being able to get up to speed or somebody who's just joined your team, hey, log into Slack and see everything that's happening over the last few months. That went away. Uh, plus then there was you know, security features and sort of advanced features and things like that. Um, but that was a really elegant way to sort of set a usage limit, but also not disincentivize people from using the product um, and inviting their friends and getting more people on to communicate. And so those have been the two best examples that I can think of that have threaded that needle sort of perfectly where you still get the value, um, it still spreads, um, but there's a really compelling reason uh, once you've sort of fell, fallen in love with the product, there's a really compelling reason to swipe the credit card. We just, uh, it's, uh, those are great examples. And we, it just goes to show like, we are so early in figuring this stuff out, it's crazy. Like we're gonna know these answers cold in five years, I just don't you know what they yeah, are. It's not I know gonna be like one see or two. Some of that. It's not yeah, going to be one like or two anecdotes the that you point to. There's yeah. going to be an actual best practice. This is how you this do it. This is the like, best practice, right? And we're just yeah. so early in figuring out it's exciting. Because another pattern I've been seeing lately is like, if you are going to try to monetize the single user uh, to drop them into the paid account as a free trial for the first 30 days and then downgrade them to the free, the free version to try to like get them addicted. And we kind of did a little like that at Sidekick. I don't remember exactly what the rules were. Was. I think there was a limitation on how many emails you could actually track, but we gave them unlimited in the first month just to get them going and then dropped them down on the tier later. Um, yeah, that's bringing in the kind of concept of uh, a reverse free trial, um, which is not mutually exclusive to a freemium package. It's like you start into the you know most advanced tier, you get all the fancy features and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then, you know, after 30 days or whatever, then you get downgraded to the free package. And so it's that loss aversion piece of like, oh, well, I, I was using all of those fancy features. I don't want them to go away. Like I'll happily swipe, swipe the credit card to keep it. But if you're not there, um, you downgrade into a package that you can still get value out of. It's not like you downgrade to, a, you know, a version of Slack and you can't send messages anymore. Um, you know, you can still send messages, you just don't get the advanced stuff. And so getting that balance right of, I, I really like the idea of leading with a free trial, you know, through this reverse free trial concept. But if somebody doesn't convert in that moment post trial, what do they downgrade to? And is there still value in that thing they downgrade to? Or is it so restrictive that they're just going to abandon? And, and that's another one of those kind of, you know, needles to thread and, and sort of, uh, you know, delicate balances to strike. Yeah, that's awesome. So let me give you three final points on that, Blake, and then you can take it if we have time. You know, so once we have that all going, all that set up and that right packaging model, um, 
two things that Belfort did and then one as we thought about layering in the sales team that I do think that are abstract points and a lot of people mess up. Um, and the first part was like, what are the North Star goals? And I do find that like most PLG teams and B2B growth teams move to monetization way too quickly. And, and the better growth teams that I've looked at don't do that. And Belfort certainly didn't say that. So usually it progresses from step one, just get enough users to just experiment with. I don't know what the right number is, maybe like 100 a week. And that's where like um, paid marketing is really useful because you can just like force a certain number of users in. And at this point, we don't really care about like CAC. We don't care how much these users cost. Yeah, um, just, just like let's get goal. some experiment. Let's get some guys. Yeah, and you can you can kickstart the flywheel going with paid marketing yeah. or things. Just get people yeah, just into get the app, going. and then we can start running ex experiments. Yep. How we can do that, and then once you have that, I'll give you fine. We figured out how to get a hundred users in a week. Great. The next one is free user attention. That we usually talk like Mao Dao Wow Mao Wow Dao monthly active user, weekly active user, daily active user, and really. Um, I actually don't, the more I think about it, I don't like the, the, um, the, the, the Dow wow ratio, um, because it just depends like how big the numbers are. Um, what we did, and I think what Balfour professes to is you just need to track your wows in like weekly cohorts and just make sure that it levels off at some point. Like it doesn't go to zero. Cause if it just goes to zero, if you acquire a hundred users and then eight weeks later, they all go to zero. You just, there's nothing there. It has to level off and whether it lands, obviously the higher the better, but if it levels off at 10% or 30% or 60%, we, we, we got something. And that's like the second North Star metric, right? And then the third was, okay, cool. Now I, I've proven that I can throw 100 users in this every week and I'll retain 30% of them. And now I've got this beautiful thing growing. Now prove to me that you can acquire those free users economically. You know what I mean? Like I, I, if I'm paying a thousand dollars a user and I'm, I'm going to generate like $500 in lifetime value from these users, this is not a business. So like, how can we acquire those users? And that's where like, now we start thinking about content marketing and virality. And I'll tell you that we walked into one month having acquired users through paid uh, acquisition. Um, and it was a hundred dollars per free user. And the team ran 27 experiments that month on that metric. And after the month, it was $14. That was just sick, right? Just like all the learning that came from that. Okay, so that was third. the third one. I was like, holy cow, now, now I can put 100 users into this thing for free users at a price that I know I can make a business at, and they retain. Now it's time for monetization. <laughs> so now it's like, okay, can we, can we get the uh, ACV to work such that the overall payback and LTV CAC to work? But all too often people are like, oh, cool, we have 100 users coming in. Now let's figure out the pricing tier. So that was like a big thing that, um, that we did differently that I see people mess up. Another cool thing that uh, Belfort did was um, forced an experiment log. It wasn't like too heavy handed, but it was just like, hey, please write like a paragraph, like literally like 10 lines of like the experiment you're gonna run. Like what is the objective, what's the hypothesis, how are you gonna run it, and then document the results. And he had to stand up every week where the growth team would come in and be like, here's the experiments I ran, the experiment I ran, here was the result, and here's what I learned, and here's the next experiment I'm gonna do. And it was like a 20 minute meeting. And everyone was kind of learning from each other. And more importantly, when someone joined the team, like three months later, they just read the experiment log. And they were like kind of like up to speed with what we knew about this buyer and product because of the experiment log. So that was that was a really cool little knit like advantage that I don't think a lot of people do. And the final one was like how we integrated the sales team, which was kind of a little more on my um, uh, my area. Because a lot of people like, you know, you've got this cool PLG motion and then you start adding salespeople and those salespeople have like a $700,000 quota and all of a sudden they start missing months and they're behind and guess what they do? They ruin the PLG motion because they end up calling those free users before the magic has happened and 
they do what salespeople do. They give a demo, they tailor the pitch, they lie, they don't set expectations right, and now your churn goes up. And now you're a sales-led company, not a product-led company. If you, your CAC goes up, everything's ruined. And so um, we had to do two things there. The first one, we started with a very small team and I didn't put them on quotas. I had like three reps and I was like, it's more about learning than it is quotas. And we had each of them do a recording every day and we invited the whole team to listen to the recording of the discovery call to learn what's happening. So this is more about learning. And then once we w moved through the funnel, we had it going and it was time for like accelerate B2B monetization that only they could do. Then I comp them by paying them more for the expansion revenue than the first revenue, which is very unusual. You know, most comp plans are you just get paid more for the first foot in the door. And then the expansion is the easy part. But when you do that, you put the sales rep behavior and motivation contradictory to the buyer's ideal adoption process. Right? Like the, the buyer's like, oh yeah, I'm loving this thing. I'll definitely upgrade to the CRM and I'll try it for this team of five people. And the salesperson's like, no, no, you have to roll it out to all 500 right away. And they don't say this, but it's because I, that's how I get paid. But if you, if you say like, you get paid 20% more for the expansion revenue, now they're aligned. Right? And I had my rep being like, oh, sweet, I got a 500 seat account on the line, and I'm going to sign up three accounts this quarter and then get the other 497 next quarter. I was like, sweet. Because you're going to set beautiful expectations for those three accounts because that's not when you get paid. You get paid when the three accounts work really well and then they upgrade. So beautiful magic happens when you kind of rethink that rollout. Yeah, the, the classic, you get what you incent. And so if you're only incenting a, a large land effectively, then that's what you're going to get. And people will jeopardize um, you know, a potential much larger expand in order to, it's like, no, don't, don't start with five users, go to all 500 now. Like, I don't want to close the deal with you because it's too small. I want to close a bigger deal, but then they're not ready for that. And so the sales cycle extends, they might not ever get there. It's closed, lost. Uh, or you could have just said, start with five, uh, we'll align the incentives and the, the compensation towards the expand as well. And then everybody's on the same page, the buyer, obviously the organization that's trying to go PLG and then the sales rep, um, who's getting incentivized for, you know, selling the right thing to the right person at the right time. So yeah, it's yeah. a beautiful way to sort of get it all to, to connect. And the other like tweak you can use instead, or also that a lot of people don't do is you can have some of the compensation be based on the aha moment, right? So let's take this, the, the, the sidekick, the HubSpot CRM that we're talking about here. Um, clearly when someone, when a user like installed the Chrome extension and started tracking emails, that was like a very sticky moment. And so, if you were running something like this, obviously we had people doing that humanlessly, but if you were running like sales team who were getting involved there, you can pay them half when the customer signs the contract and half when they set it up and use it, whatever your aha moment is. And they've done that with lots and lots of companies. And what, what ends up happening is the salesperson gets the aha moment set up during the sales process as opposed to waiting until the purchase happens. And that just like tees up your CSM team, it sets really good expectations, it really lowers churn, like it just a lot of beautiful, beautiful things happen there. Yeah, in, in that case, which is incredibly important in, in any product, but especially in PLG is uh, orienting towards activation. Uh, and in that regard, you're kind of incentivizing the salesperson to, you're literally incentivizing the salesperson uh, to help a customer not just sign a contract, but actually get activated, get to the aha moment so that then they can be successful thereafter. And so it prevents some of the issues that happen uh, when there's too much of a silo between sales and CSM, 
where it's just like, all right, I closed the deal, like throw it over the wall. Good luck, everybody. <laughs> um, hopefully you can implement the thing that I sold. Um, you know, you're, you're sort of pulling the activation step. You're pulling that aha moment into the sales process um, and wanting the salesperson to be 100% focused on it and to help them get set up right out of the gates, which again, then, you know, it makes the customer more successful. It makes uh, CS's job easier uh, and everybody's, you know, on the same page. Exactly. Yeah. So taking a step all the way back, there's some things, you know, here that you sort of outlined in terms of the process, again, for a company that might want to, to look to do this. And I think those process pieces are incredibly important and valuable. Things like, you know, creating a sandbox. Um, you gave a couple examples as to how you could create that sandbox. We're going to launch a new product. We're going to go into a new geo, something like that. Um, and then once the sandbox is created, it's like give them freedom. Uh, the goal is not synergies on day one. The goal is, you know, figure out the right answer for this market. Uh, give the operating leeway, you know, all those kinds of things. But then once you've done those things from an infrastructure standpoint, you got the right team in place. Um, the, the principles that are coming through to me is, you know, start small and be patient. You know, the starting small piece is you didn't try to build, you know, a full featured uh, CRM replacement right out of the gates. You, you said, what's the thing that can add value to an individual user? Uh, and you started there and it's, let, let's get them hooked. Uh, let's get them loving it. Let's get them telling their, their colleagues and friends and peers about this thing. Uh, and let's get, you know, retention and value and aha moment and activation out of sort of something that might just be more of like a feature. It's not even a product yet. <laughs> it just does one thing. Uh, but then we can use that as, you know, the starting point to then build more. But we started small. Uh, we didn't bite off more than we could chew. Um, and, and then on the be patient piece, I mean, there's so many elements of, of being patient that you pointed to. Uh, whether it's uh, not focusing on CAC on day one because, you know, beautiful SaaS metrics isn't the goal. Product market fit and building the right thing that can take off is the goal. Um, you know, being patient on when do you monetize and, and how early do you expect to see sort of revenue results? Uh, when do you put sales in there? All of those things. Again, it's um, don't get too excited too early and sort of, uh, you know, screw up all the progress you just made uh, because, you know, it's sort of delicate, right? You know, it's the wheels are still wobbling a little bit. And so you need to give it the patience, give it the time uh, to mature. And then once it is working, um, then you can kind of, you know, once you've nailed it, then you can scale it sort of thing. That's a great summary. That's a great summary. And I, yeah, I think that last part is, is a key point that we didn't really talk about. Like a lot of these practices, right? Putting the team product oriented, the way we measure, the way we run experiments, how you overlay, that, that's, that's applicable whether you're trying to move to this or you're building it from scratch. But if we just talk about how do you move to this, that, that sandbox, carving out that sandbox, separating out that team, setting up that team in the right way, and then that your point, Blake, is like once it works, you disrupt yourself before someone else does. And that comes in a lot of different flavors. For us, it was easy because it was a different product. So we just kind of brought them together and we had to train the sales team, the core sales team on selling both and should support team and that, that was a process there. Um, for other folks, I know like, they like, they like when, when salespeople in certain territories quit, they don't replace them. They just let the PLG take over the territory, right? So like, it depends on your business context. But you essentially have to find a way to disrupt yourself. And that's why I kind of like, um, you might have to cannibalize your revenue a little bit. And so for growth startups, I typically like them to do that disruption process when they're capitalized. Because like, you might have a quarter or two of like some wonky numbers. And so whether that's just like, obviously it's a very transparent conversation with your investor, but it's just like maybe a new investor coming in and be like, listen, this is what we're going to do. And it might create some like weird revenue for like a quarter or two, but this is the business that comes out or your existing investors, right? It just needs to be like, you, you might have some wonky a quarter or two and that, that, that takes some guts, but it's better than taking your medicine in a year when you lose market share from someone else. Yeah, because then it's too late. You're not disrupting yourself. You're responding to another disruptor. Um, so you're trying to prevent them from disrupting you while you still need to disrupt yourself. And so it's, yeah, it's uh, good luck in that situation. Um, but uh, but yeah, what I'm hearing there, and, and you sort of alluded to it earlier in the conversation, is that even if you're massively successful with this whole experimentation and everything, there still will be challenges. 
if you disrupt yourself, guess what? It's disruptive. <laughs> um, you know, you gave the example of, um, you know, when you have this self-service product that's oriented to individual end users and it's free and anybody can sign up for it, you know, the volume of signups is going to be high. And if you aren't a PLG business, you know, you're used to sort of, okay, well, we closed this account. They went through a sales process. We got to close one. Here's the contract. Here's the number of users. Now it's ready. And it's like a constrained number of accounts per month. Obviously, it's going to keep going up. But you blow the, the doors off of that number, uh, you know, once you, you start having self-service signups. And then you gave the example of then what does that do to support? You know, I'm getting way more support tickets from people using this brand new product that I don't know anything about than the core product that we've been selling for five years, 10 years, whatever. That's disruptive. That's not a sign that PLG broke and that you should retreat and um, sort of, uh oh, too much things are breaking inside the organization. It's actually a signal that things are going right. You're disrupting yourself and it is disruptive. And so lean into that. Give your uh, back to the idea of being patient. Uh, give the organization patience now that the sort of PLG experiment is working uh, because there's a big change management process um, to actually disrupt the rest of your organization that's been a going concern for five years, 10 years, perhaps more. This is the definition of leadership, right? It's not easy. You've got to get through it. So just like you said, like, yeah, all these, I mean, I, having done it with a couple of folks, get ready for this. Like your VP of sales is going to come to you being like, you are killing me. You are killing me. My reps can't make quota because why would anyone pay, you know, twenty, thirty thousand $30,000 for our product? when you're giving it away. I can't do my job. I can't do my job. Well, Turn guess what? Off. If you let the VP of sales win, they're gonna start losing to someone else that has, that has built that product. So it's just like, it's, a, it's, a, it's just the reality. Yep. So on this point of leadership, um, there's, there's a lot of founders listening right now. There's a lot of leaders listening right now who are in this exact position. I want to go to PLG, I have the full conviction, but we have a going concern. We have a company that's been around for 10 years. Um, it's going to be a process. I want to do it. Um, this story is incredibly helpful. These frameworks are incredibly helpful, but it's gonna be a journey of a thousand miles and I need to take the first step. So what does that first step look like? And, and how long should they take, or how long should they expect for that first step to start showing some results? Yeah, I love it when I'm, like it's actually just in the last six months, I'm seeing this issue come up 30 out of 30 times. So it's starting to be like, and, and when they when they listen and fix it, it's like, oh my gosh, it's like, it helps a lot. So here's what happens is I'll, I'll, I'll kind of talk about this and be like, all right, is your category PLGable? And we'll decide, oh my gosh, it is, it's PLGable. And we're already seeing some, some attackers get funded and we're at 30 million now and they're only at like half a million, but we're really worried and we have to do something. And they're like, okay, we're gonna do it. And I'm like, okay, cool, carve out the this carve out the sandbox, build the team, they got it. And then they're like, okay, we're gonna um, start the first experiment in three months. And I'm like, wait, wait, dude, <laughs> what do you mean? Three months, what are you doing? He's like, oh, well, we have to build this whole self-service onboarding process. And I'm like, no, no, you're gonna get it wrong. Here's what you're gonna do. Like, fine, build some sort of MVP or like, use the existing product to like to hack it and just put up a landing page that says what your product does, try now, direct some paid traffic to it, and then do the, 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 man, the person behind the, count, uh, the curtain, Wizard of Oz technique, have someone call them right away and just be like, oh, cool. Thanks for signing up to our product. Let me show you how to, let me get you set up and go to work. Like don't build the, don't spend three months building the free user flow. Like just hack it and have a have the engineers or PM like sit with the person that's taking those calls and watch like where people get hung up. Like give the user the control to get things set up and tell them what to do. And and just now you start building up dozens and dozens of users next week. Right? So use the 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 Wizard of Oz like person behind the curtain initially. Don't wait 90 days to build your free user flow and build it wrong. Yeah, because if nobody's going to that landing page and then the people that do go to that landing page, if nobody, no, no one is clicking try it now, then it doesn't matter if you have a great user signup flow. Like you haven't built something that's uh, attractive. Yeah. So like start small. You haven't thought of something that's great. It's yeah. not great, right? Yeah, 
No, this is great. So, so yeah, start small, be patient, but also orient towards action and don't overcomplicate things. Like if you need to do the person behind the curtain strategy in order to get some initial signal, if you need to use paid marketing to juice signups just to see if there's any value here at all, you know, all the things we've talked about sort of, um, you know, embody these three things. Start small, be patient, but also orient towards action and like get things done and get them done week in, week out. It's all about, you know, whether it's experimentation, it's about volume, whether it's about, you know, product features that you're shipping, it's about volume and it's about speed. And so this is a perfect summary of both the story um, that I point to so often. Uh, and guess what? I'm going to point a lot of people to this podcast because this question is going to keep coming. And I'm like, you know, go check out this uh, long version of it, you know, with Mark, who was there on the front lines. Um, and, and so I think the story is going to continue to to sort of go out there and is going to have a lot of value, but especially when it's combined with these sort of principles of how do you do it operationally? And then, you know, keeping in mind that you need to start small, be patient, orient towards action. Uh, and then once you disrupt yourself, it's going to be disruptive, lean into it. Uh, I think this is perfect. Um, it's going to be valuable to so many people. So thank you, Mark, so much for joining us here in the Build Podcast and walking us through your thoughts here. Yeah, it was so great to get so deep, Like, Appreciate it. 